All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, we are just uh, getting started today. If you don't mind opening up your chat box and confirming whether you can hear me and see me, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box if you can hear me and see me, please. Awesome. And hopefully the chat box is uh, able to be used. Go ahead and type in hello into the chat box if you're able to. All right. Looks like the chat box is disabled for some reason, which it shouldn't be. Let me go ahead and look at the Zoom features real quick. All right. Well, it looks like the chat box feature is uh, not necessarily um, perfect. All right, great. I think we have the chat box. Go ahead and type into the chat box. Awesome. All right. Wonderful. Sorry about that, guys. For some reason, uh, that small uh, button uh, was very hard to find. All right. Well, Thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today. If you don't mind, uh, just so that we get uh, great interaction uh, in during this webinar, do you mind just typing in where you all are logging in from? Usually, we have a very international audience. Wow. Croatia, Alabama, Michigan, D.C. Excellent. Seattle. Wonderful. Well. I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for joining this live stream. I feel like it has been a little bit of time uh, since I've done my last live stream. And I want to let you know that I'm going uh, to be back on it as I've graduated fellowship, a lot of different life uh, changes on my end. Today, what we're going to be going through is cardiovascular microbiology. This is going to be a new series. And if this is your first time joining my webinars, I welcome you and want to introduce myself. My name is Rahul. I just finished my fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine, and I am actually now pursuing my master's in medical education. I'll be graduating in two years. I'm also going to be starting my attending pediatric critical care position as well concurrently. Over the past seven years, I have just been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you prepare for an Excel on the US only exam. And here's my email. If you have any questions, I'll get, I'll do my best to get back to you in a timely manner. Now, I know that there are so many resources out there and Hi Guru is up and coming. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes as we get started today to really highlight what makes Hi Guru so unique. Hi Guru really focuses on evidence-based medicine in the sense that I really focus on high value learning techniques for the USMLE. All of my lectures are rooted in active recall, and I try to make connections with materials across different organ systems and content domains. You will see that today. And then finally, I really focus on test-taking strategy because test-taking strategy is going to allow you to think like the test maker and excel your performance on exam day. Whenever I prepare students in my pass-fail course, as well as one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I focus on this triad, and that is making sure you can integrate content and learn content in an effective manner, have a scaffold to apply the information, get productive each and every day. I typically leverage Notion to really optimize student productivity, and I recognize 
that there are many psychological factors which go into either preparation or exam day. And I'd like to address that um, by uh, emphasizing test-taking psychology. Most importantly, and we have over 100 people joining us today, it has been absolutely awesome to grow High Guru one student at a time. And this, uh, these are some pictures of uh, my first classes when I was teaching uh, in medical schools live. And now here we are online and we're a global community of lifelong learners preparing for the USMLE. This has been an absolutely humbling experience for me. Also, I want to let you know that my pass-fail course has uh, gained great popularity and great results for uh, students who have recently taken the USMLE Step 1 exam. I would highly encourage you to uh, check uh, this course out. But first, without any further ado, let's go ahead and start with our webinar today. This is going to be very interactive. If you're ready to go ahead and get started, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box, please. Wonderful. Brittany, Rhea, Virginia, Trisha, Maria, Bianca. All right. A lot of people are ready. I just want to give you one important disclaimer. I ask for an hour, hour and 15 minutes of your time. This material, very relevant for the USMLE Step 1 exam. I want you to really cut out distractions, open up your chat box, Maybe have your first date out so you can cross-reference some things, but I would highly encourage you to maintain focus during this session because I promise you it's going to be fun, engaging, and full of high-yield content. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to be dividing this webinar up into the introduction to integrated microbiology for the USMLE, as well as go into cardiology. This is a brand new series that I'm going to be starting on Zoom and my YouTube live streams, and I'm so glad you are joining me today. Now, the goal of this series of webinars is the following. Many of you are using Sketchy Micro, for example, for your USMLE preparation, and I think that's great. However, I'm going to add a different angle, and I'm going to add a very high value angle to your preparation, and that is really emphasizing how the NBME and USMLE tests many of these microbes. Remember that when the NBME and USMLE write questions for exam day, they usually test microbiology in the context of an organ system pathology or dysfunction. And so that's why over the series of the next webinars, we're going to be going through organ systems based microbiology. This is very innovative because traditionally you were taught in a very linear manner. However, I really want to emphasize pathophysiology, microbiology, and test-taking strategy, especially uh, for exam day. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go into the overview. With regards to integrated microbiology, I want to first emphasize how important microbiology is for the USMLE. In my opinion, microbiology, as well as even pharmacology, are easy points for exam day. And then finally, I'm going to be going through some test-taking strategies for how I approach infectious disease questions. We're then going to be pivoting today and talk a little bit about cardiovascular microbiology. I'm going to be covering endocarditis, rheumatic fever. We're going to be integrating microbes such as Strep pyogenes, Coxsackie B, et cetera. This just gives you a flavor of what microbes are associated with cardiology. All right, so when it comes to the approach to microbiology on the USMLE, here is going to be table three uh, from the uh, USMLE website. And it shows that microbiology is about 10 to 15% of the USMLE exam. I also want to emphasize that immunology goes hand in hand with microbiology because at times the USMLE is going to test the immune response to certain microbes. Further, I think that there are many pathologies, especially the ones that we see today, that will go under this content uh, specification, and that is multi-system processes. Remember that infection can be ever pervasive. The most common complication or the, uh, or excuse me, the most severe complication is going to be sepsis, where you have multi-organ dysfunction. And that's why microbiology can be under this content domain as well. 
Now, what does the USMLE like to test related to microbiology? Well, identification, i.e. morphology or lab uh, diagnosis, different replication patterns, especially for uh, virology. And a particular emphasis is placed on virulence factors. And this relates to the pathologies that the different microbes cause. And so understanding the mechanisms of disease behind these microbes is going to be very important, especially for fungi and parasitology, paying attention to endemic regions, antibiotics and microbes exhibit mechanisms of resistance, and the USMLE likes to test that along with bacterial genetics. And then finally, the immune response, which I uh, briefly mentioned. Remember that microbiology is going to be under the auspices of medical knowledge and applying foundational science concepts. You can see some of these headings when you're analyzing your practice NBMEs. Microbes can also be tested as what is the most likely diagnosis. And it may not be the specific microbe, but the actual clinical syndrome that they cause. For example, pneumonia, endocarditis, et cetera. Now, here are some relevant microbiology stems that I've seen throughout various NBMEs. Number one, what is the likely etiology? Number two, what is the likely diagnosis? Number three, what is the most likely mechanism? And this goes through that virulence factor uh, emphasis, which I was talking to you about. What is the likely morphology? What is the likely virulence factor, which explains the patient's invasive disease? And what is the likely immune response? These are all sample stems that you will see both in your question banks as well as on the NBME. For many of the microbes, especially the very high yield microbes, I'm going to teach them in a very uh, unique table form. And that is we're gonna go through the organism, the disease it causes, how do you identify it, i.e. lab characteristics and morphology, the virulence factors, the mode of transmission, which I think is particularly important because what uh, the USMLE uh, can do with the mode of transmission is give you some more public health uh, type of questions, such as how do you prevent this? For example, C. diff, you have to do hand washing with soap and water. And then finally, we're going to go through pharmacologic uh, integrations. So let's go through a sample organism just to give you a, a little bit of a background. When it comes to uh, strep pneumonia, for example, it causes pneumonia, sinusitis, otitis, bronchitis, and meningitis. We identify it as a gram-positive lancet-shaped dipylcoxi that is alpha hemolytic, catalase negative, and optogen sensitive. Some of the virulence factors, polysaccharide capsule, which remember evades phagocytosis, IgA protease, that's important because uh, that is why uh, strep pneumonia causes sinusitis, otitis, and pneumonia. The mode of transmission is going to be via contact or aerosol droplets. And then finally, pharmacology integrations, particularly related to vaccines. Remember patients with asplenia, are going to need amoxicillin prophylaxis because strep pneumo is an encapsulated organism and patients who have sickle cell disease, or for example, on your exam, present with a car accident and then they get a splenectomy, all of those patients are at risk for invasive encapsulated organisms such as strep pneumo. One of the key learning strategies that I would emphasize as you're preparing for the USMLE is to have micro learning. And what that means is that when you're in the moment, you want to actively recall certain concepts. You probably have seen some of my pharmacology lectures and in my pharmacology lectures, I emphasize that anytime you see a pharmacological agent, what do you need to do? Recall the mechanism of action. And I think that that is extremely high yield. Same thing. Anytime you see a microbe, such as a bacteria, virus, or fungi, you want to actively recall the morphology or the key identifiers, because maybe some of the answer choices will be associated with labs or gram stain slash uh, uh, virus uh, morphology. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and pivot into how I approach test taking with infectious disease questions on the USMLE. If you are interested in uh, optimizing your test-taking strategy approach and 
you feel like um, private tutoring may not be for you, then I would highly encourage you to check out my USMLE test taking strategies course. It is 15 hours of jam packed material. And this is a little bit of an excerpt from that, but it shows you how to approach various types of questions. In this case, we're going to be going through infectious disease questions, but that approach to questions, I think helps with U world percentages as well as NBME performance. Before I go into this uh, next introduction uh, section, are you guys learning something? Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Awesome. Angela is paying attention. Sandy, Maria, Hung, Trisha, Remya. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your attention. Let's keep going. What I really want you to uh, recognize uh, on uh, infectious disease questions is that these patients are going to present with vital sign abnormalities. Now, when it comes to vital sign abnormalities, one of the key vital sign abnormalities that patients who are experiencing an infection are going to have on your USMLE is a temperature. When we think about temperature, normal temperature is going to be anywhere between 36 and 37.5. What are the causes of hyperthermia on the USMLE? And again, this is in the vitals sentence in your vignette. The mental model you need to have is either it's infectious, which is what we're talking about, or inflammatory. And that's where you check out some of my rheumatology videos. Many patients who have infection on the USMLE are going to present with hyperthermia. And what I want you to uh, uh, note is that when it comes to infectious etiologies, you want to categorize in your question whether you're dealing with a bacterial, viral, fungi, or parasite, and especially look at the host status. In particular, you want to figure out whether they are immunocompetent or immunocompromised. You also want to look for the source of infection. And this is important for step two CK, but I think it's relevant for step one. When we're thinking about bloodstream infections, the source of the infection may be, for example, in the heart, i.e. endocarditis. Sources of infection could be in the urine, in the meninges, in the lungs, et cetera. So what you want to do is identify the source of infection along with host status. Now, there are inflammatory conditions that can cause fever. That's going to be out of the scope of what we're going to be talking about. But again, check out my rheumatology videos for that. And there are some pharmacological agents. I can't help but uh, uh, emphasize that aspirin uh, toxicity is always tested on NBME and USMLE exams. Remember, aspirin is going to be a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. It inhibits prostaglandins. It's going to uh, cause you to have mitochondrial issues and thus hyperthermia due to slowing down the electron transport chain. With regards to aspirin, just to give you an integrated point, patients present with the respiratory alkalosis and then subsequently a anti-gap metabolic acidosis in uh, your USMLE questions related to aspirin overdose. Now, before we go on uh, a little bit further, we just talked about hyperthermia as being an important um, cause that clues you into infection or inflammation. But remember that hypothermia, especially in immunocompromised patients, but in particular neonates can also be seen. So a neonate, i.e. a baby on your USMLE less than 28 days that is going to have temperature instability that is a uh, 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 going to include, for example, hypothermia, you really want to think about an infection. So it's not just hyperthermia. Speaking of infectious disease and host status, I really want you to paraphrase in vignettes an immu immunocompromised host. So who are immunocompromised hosts? Those patients with an immunodeficiency. For example, if they have recurrent B or T cell infections, maybe if it's a child, uh, there's failure to thrive. Chronic diseases with immunosuppression can cause you to have an immunocompromised host status. So for example, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes due to the high glucose load and the suppression of the immune response as a result, as well as oncology. Remember, a lot of chemotherapeutics uh, are going to decrease your absolute neutrophil count, and thus patients on your USMLE exam are going to be noted to be immunocompromised. Other immunocompromised populations that are going to be seen in your vignettes, organ or 
bone marrow transplant recipient, as well as patients with high-risk social factors. For example, maybe they have IV drug abuse or heavy smoking or alcoholism. The other thing to watch out for is the medications that are immunosuppressants, things like tacrolimus, sirolimus, chemotherapeutics, mycophenolate, mofetil. These are all put in the vignettes along with chronic steroids to tell you, hey, you're dealing with the immunocompromised host. So we talked about hyperthermia as one of the cluins. Hey, we're dealing with infectious disease or microbiology question. We talked about the importance of stratifying whether you have an immunocompetent or immunocompromised host. And then finally, we are going to be delving into microbiology by integrating a little bit of immunology. And that is this recognition of acute inflammation. Many microbiological agents cause acute inflammation. So in a USMLE vignette, when you're dealing with acute inflammation, what are you going to see? Well, in the history of present illness and the physical exam in your vignette, you're going to see the cardinal signs of inflammation, things like rubor, calor, dolor, tumor, functiolacea. These are all going to mean that a certain portion of the body is red, hot, swollen, painful, or inflamed. Vital signs that you'll see, again, could be fever as well as potentially tachycardia. And you want to correlate this acute inflammation to organ systems. For example, a patient who presents with signs of heart failure, fever, and chest pain may have myocarditis. And again, it's all about emphasizing or looking into the itis portion. So when we think like the test maker and kind of put all of this stuff together, Let's say you see a patient who has fever plus a skin rash. Well, that's going to be cellulitis. Fever plus neck stiffness, meningitis. Fever plus a murmur, endocarditis, which we're going to emphasize in today's session. Fever plus chest pain, another emphasis today, pericarditis or pericardial effusion. You could also have pleuritis in patients who have rheumatologic disease such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Fever plus testicular pain or chitis. Remember the microbiology tie-in is mumps. Fever plus cervical motion tenderness, PID. Remember that could be due to Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia. Fever plus joint pain, arthritis. And once you've defined the clinical disease, you then want to integrate the microbiology or rheumatologic uh, disease in the case of an arthritis. So the goal here is to recognize the itis and whether they are immunocompetent, immunocompromised, then you go into the specific microbes. And that's very important uh, for us to know. Another important immunology tie-in that shows up on exams is going to be the mediators for fevers, IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and PGE-2. Remember that these are pyrogens and they are going to alter the hypothalamic set point. And that is a key virulence factors that many microbes have is that they alter or increase the hypothalamic set point. And that's why you can see shivering as your body is trying to get to that new set point. So let's go ahead and summarize the USMLE test taking strategy for infectious disease questions. Number one, you want to identify inflammation, the itis. You then want to also consider where is the source of infection. You then want to define the clinical syndrome. Subsequently, you want to look for any immunocompromised host status. And then finally, you want to integrate potential pathogens. This is a little bit more of a comprehensive approach, and I want to make sure we are going to apply this in uh, multiple choice questions. So let's go through this one together. A 50-year-old with history of lung transplant due to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis presents with shortness of breath non-productive cough, and low-grade fevers. His medications include mycophenolate, mofetil, and chronic oral steroids. Temperature is 100.4. Chest x-ray is notable for bilateral interstitial infiltrates. He has a markedly reduced FVC, or forced vital capacity. And lung biopsy is notable for intranuclear inclusions. Which of the following best describes the morphology of the likely etiology. Before I ask you to put the answer into the chat box, I want you to uh, put into the chat box, is this patient immunocompetent or immunocompromised? What do you think? 
immunocompetent or immunocompromised? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Wonderful. And I'm getting many compromised. And that's because the patient has a lung transplant, is on immunosuppressants, especially things like uh, chronic steroids. Now, why don't we go ahead and go through what you think the likely answer is to this question. Go ahead and put your answer into the chat. So this patient who's immunocompromised, who plus or minus uh, has the shortness of breath and pneumonia with the intranuclear inclusions. Wonderful. I'm seeing a lot of B in the chat box and you're absolutely correct when you're thinking about CMV, which is a double-stranded DNA virus that is going to be enveloped. Very high yield for us to know. So going back to our test-taking strategy, we can really kind of apply uh, this question. Remember that this patient has fever and shortness of breath. We think that the source of infection is in the lungs and the clinical syndrome is in pneumonia. The host status is immunocompromised. And because the patient is immunocompromised, you're not necessarily going to be thinking about agents as much as like strep pneumo or mycoplasma, right? In this case, the patient had the intranuclear inclusions, and that's why we were worried about CMV. And again, CMV is seen as a uh, infection in immunocompromised patients. All right, that concludes the introduction of uh, microbiology that I wanted to uh, give you all. I hope you found this very helpful. And now we're going to go into specific cardiac microbiology. Are you guys ready to go into cardiac microbiology? Yes or no? Awesome. Wonderful. Hey, thank you all so much. Please make sure you save your questions until the end. I'm going to do a live Q&A uh, at the end as well. Awesome, Arun. Thanks so much for your uh, enthusiasm. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and go into this question. A 50-year-old female presents with 10 days of fevers and fatigue. She has felt warm, especially at night. She has no cough or shortness of breath. She has a history of an abnormal echocardiogram. Vital signs are notable for a fever. A three out of six murmur is heard at the apex. Laboratory studies are notable for CRP of 9.2, which is elevated. Blood cultures are drawn and within 48 hours are notable for dextran producing gram positive organisms. Upon further history taking, which of the following would most likely be present? A, history of ocular infection. B, prodrome of influenza. C, surgical history of dental procedure. Or D, recent colonoscopy. What do you think is the answer? And if you're watching this at a later time, go ahead and pause the video and try to figure out the answer on your own before we go through the explanation. Excellent. Many students are putting C, and if you said history of dental procedure, you're absolutely correct. This patient with indolent symptoms and fever plus a murmur, very high yield for us to know, that is the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. And specifically, it's going to be subacute bacterial endocarditis. So let's go through the pathophysiology of subacute bacterial endocarditis. Number one, recognize that this patient had an abnormal cardiac uh, uh, echo, card or excuse me, the patient had an abnormal echocardiogram. Anybody, some, any, anytime somebody has a abnormal cardiac exam, they have a predisposition to subacute bacterial endocarditis, i.e. a previously damaged heart valve ends up being a fibrin platelet nidus right on that valve. Now, anytime you have fibrin and platelets there, the bacteria can adhere to it. And in this case, you have translocation of oral flora from the dental procedure that then is going to colonize the valve and cause valvular incompetency. You're going to have a biofilm formation and you're going to have these systemic embolic phenomena, which essentially means that the vegetation dislodges from the cardiac valve and then causes systemic manifestations and end organ dysfunction. The oral flora and the pathogens behind subacute bacterial endocarditis is typically your viridans group streptococci. And again, here's a microbiological agent. So let's go ahead and go into the morphology. Remember that it is a gram positive 
usually it is going to be uh, cocci in chains. It is alpha hemolytic, so partially uh, uh, partial hemolysis, optogen resistant, and it makes dextrans, or uh, which are part of that biofilm. Now, optogen resistant, I like to say that the viridans, which live in the mouth, are not afraid of the chin. And that helps me remember that they are optogen resistant. All right, let's go ahead and integrate the various microbes you need to know, along with viridans streptococci, that produce this biofilm. This is high yield, very heavily tested. Remember that viridans streptococci, we talked about the morphology and the USMLE vignettes are typically going to be fever plus a murmur plus dental procedures. Staph epidermidis. What's important here is that it is a gram positive cocci in clusters, but remember, staph species are going to be catalase positive. And in the case of epidermidis, it's going to be coagulase negative. It's also going to be novobiosin sensitive. Staph epidermidis likes to produce biofilms on prosthetic material. For example, in your USMLE questions, you may have fever plus a patient who has a history of hip or knee replacement. And you also want to consider staph epidermidis as a skin contaminant when a patient is uh, getting a blood culture performed. Pseudomonas can also make a biofilm. Remember that pseudomonas is a gram-negative bacillus. It is oxidase positive. And USMLE vignettes related to pseudomonas and biofilm production in particular are things like cystic fibrosis. Remember, these patients are going to have respiratory colonization with MRSA and pseudomonas. Patient in the ICU with the new infiltrate on chest x-ray, this is going to be the vignette of ventilator-associated pneumonia, as well as the contact keratitis that you can see in a patient who has con who's a contact lens user has a painful um, eye and purulent discharge and erythema of the eye. Very high yield for us to know that pseudomonas is going to be a cause of conjunctivitis in contact lens wearers. Finally, non-typable H flu is going to uh, be a organism that makes a biofilm. Remember that Non-typable H influenza is different than typable H flu. Typable H flu causes your um, epiglottitis. Now, non-typable H flu is a gram-negative rod. It is oxidase positive. And because this is non-typable, it has no polysaccharide capsule. What's important for us to know is that non-typable H flu typically presents as otitis media. So how does otitis media present? Fever plus ear pain, they can say a bulging tympanic membrane indicating that the middle ear is going to be inflamed and infected and a decreased light reflex on otic exam. All right, so for you visual learners, let's go through subacute bacterial endocarditis in a little bit uh, more depth. When we think about subacute bacterial endocarditis, it's a previously damage heart valve. Patients may also have mitral valve prolapse as a predisposing lesion. Bacteria is going to um, invade the platelet and fibrin plug. It is going to attract inflammatory cells and create a persistent vegetation. And over time, you may get damage to the valve via fibrosis. And uh, you could, again, get some of these vegetations that can dislodge. And I'm going to emphasize that in the upcoming slides. Here is going to be a picture of uh, a, a gross pathology of the heart, which shows the vegetations on uh, the valves themselves. All right. So going into a summary of viridan streptococci, remember that your specific organisms are going to be strep mutans and strep uh, uh, sanguis. When we think about the disease that they cause, they cause dental caries as well as subacute bacterial endocarditis. How are we gonna identify them? Well, again, gram-positive organism, it is alpha hemolysis, they are not afraid of the chin, and they take sucrose or sugar, and they are going to turn them into dextrans, which end up being part of the biofilm. And that's um, in particular, one of the virulence factors that uh, Sanguis has as well. Mode of transmission, remember 
In the case of subacute bacterial endocarditis, it's this translocation from the oral for flora. And in terms of uh, pharmacology integrations, remember for viridan streptococci, we use beta lactams such as penicillins. What's important for us to know for step two and step three is the antibiotic prophylaxis for invasive dental procedures. The indications are what we're going to review in the coming slides, but typically patients who have a history of endocarditis that are going to then undergo dental procedures are going to get amoxicillin or clindamycin prophylaxis. So who are other patients besides prior history of infective endocarditis? Well, patients who have prosthetic heart valves are going to get infective endocarditis prophylaxis, congenital heart disease that is especially unrepaired or with prosthetic material such as a uh, graft, and then finally, cardiac transplant recipients with abnormal valves. This is, again, more high yield for step two, but I want to uh, put this in here for completeness sake. The pharmacology integration, typically these patients prior to their uh, dental procedure are going to get amoxicillin or clindamycin. I want to integrate the phar pharmacology and mechanism of action. Remember, what many of the beta lactams do, like the amino penicillins, amoxicillin, is they inhibit penicillin binding protein or PBP2A. And remember that clindamycin, is it going to affect the 50S ribosomal subunit or 30S? Go ahead and type that into the chat. Is it 50S or 30S? Awesome. Keep engaged. I love that. And it's going to be 50S ribosomal subunit. Very good. All right. So I want to compare and contrast the vignette that you'll see with subacute endocarditis with florid acute endocarditis. It's subtle, but I want you to uh, uh, understand that when it comes to acute endocarditis, it can happen to normal heart valves. Typically, this is a rapid onset of fever plus a murmur. The patients in your vignette are going to be very sick. The microbe behind acute endocarditis is a little bit different than the subacute endocarditis. In acute endocarditis, you're going to be thinking about the gram-positive, catalase-positive, cocci and clusters, which is going to be staph aureus. Now, subacute endocarditis, it's different because remember, the patients in your vignettes have a history of a disease valve. They're more indolent or slow onset symptoms. And we're thinking about your viridan strep species as your more common microbes. One of the things that I want to emphasize with acute bacterial endocarditis is the fact that whenever there's a vegetation on a valve, these vegetations can dislodge and go into the aorta and subsequently the bloodstream. That's why when you see fever plus a murmur, one of the key next best steps in management is to get a blood culture. Why? Because if we get a blood culture, we can see potentially what type of microbes are going to be on the uh, heart, or if the heart has a vegetation, we want to know what is a microbe so we can tailor our antibiotic therapy accordingly. So vegetation on the valve can translocate and cause bacteremia or sepsis, and that's uh, particularly uh, high yield uh, for you to see in these uh, bacterial endocarditis questions. Now, when it comes to infective endocarditis, we're talking about these now embolic phenomena. But remember, infective endocarditis can be due to local cardiac infiltration or even bacteremia. So patients who have bacteremia can then have uh, vegetations on the valve. So infective endocarditis can cause bacteremia. Bacteremia can cause infective endocarditis. The phenomena that the USMLA likes to go for are the vascular and the immunological phenomena. Let's go through them. The vascular phenomena involve emboli as well as aneurysms. Remember, some of these aneurysms are due to the bacteria getting uh, into the tunica media of blood vessels and causing an aneurysmal dilation or weakening of the blood vessel. We are also going to be th thinking about Janeway lesions, which are going to be contrasted with Osler nodes. Which one are painful? Go ahead and put them in the chat. Which one is painful, Janeway or Osler? Okay. Excellent. And if you said Osler nodes, you're absolutely correct. Ouch, ouch, Osler. 
The other immunologic phenomena are going to be Roth spots, okay? And these are seen in the retina. So let's review this. When we're thinking about embolic phenomena, that's going to be your splinter hemorrhages, the Janeway lesions on the palms. Again, it is a vascular lesion. The immunological phenomena, the painful ouch, ouch, ozer on the tips of the fingers, and then the retinal Roth spots. All right. I think this is also a very high yield USMLE vignette. And I wanted to add this here, especially when we're talking about infective uh, endocarditis. Remember that IV drug abusers typically are going to have right sided endocarditis. And this is just testing you on the uh, anatomy and the drainage pattern. Typically, IV drug abusers are going to uh, shoot up fentanyl, heroin, et cetera, through uh, their IV. And that's going to drain via the vena cava and hit the tricuspid valve first if you're thinking about a structurally normal heart. All right, let's go through this high yield question. So a patient presents with fever and chills. He is noted to be febrile and tachycardic. His blood culture grows staph aureus. Chest X-ray is notable for bilateral multifocal cavitary lesions. Which of the following sites would be most likely abnormal on auscultation? Go ahead and put your answer into the chat box. All right. Excellent. And if you said C, you're absolutely correct. This is going to be tricuspid valve endocarditis. And why is that? Well, remember that the patient has acute endocarditis, but in particular has multifocal pulmonary lesions. So that indicates the fact that the vegetation on the tricuspid valve ended up dislodging and caused pulmonary septic emboli. Let's review this in a little bit more uh, depth. Remember that the key to IV drug abuse and endocarditis on the USMLE are the following. Watch for immunocompromised status. The most common organism is Staph aureus. You can also have Candida, for example. The most common valve is going to be tricuspid, and that is typically at the fourth or fifth intercostal space at the left lower sternal border, which was the answer to the question and watch for the pulmonary emboli. And the US only likes to go for this because they want you to understand the normal flow pattern in a structurally normal heart. Tricuspid vegetation can then get access to the pulmonary circulation um, as you see in this X-ray. All right, let's continue on with the microbiology review. An elderly patient who has fever plus murmur plus history of cystoscopy slash colonoscopy or they say the patient has fever plus murmur plus UTI or even BPH. What do you think is the likely organism here? And if you're thinking enterococcus, you're absolutely correct. So enterococcus, you want to watch for these risk factors. What would be the likely microbe in a USMLE vignette if a patient had infective endocarditis and underlying colon cancer? Go ahead and put your answer into the chat. Awesome. And I want you all to really um, uh, make sure you're typing these answers into the chat box because that can also aid in memory formation as well. Wonderful. And if you're thinking about strep gallolyticus or strep bovis, you're absolutely correct. Very good. So let's go ahead and review the two microbes we just talked about. Enterococcus faecalis, remember it can cause endocarditis as well as UTIs. The identification is that it is a gram positive cocci in pairs that ends up uh, with variable hemolysis and it also grows in bile. The way that I remember that is that enterococcus entro means gut, so it's gonna grow in the gut. Transmission is going to be translocation from the GI 
or the urinary uh, system. And pharmacology integrations are the following. We typically use ampicillin for enterococcus infections. However, if there's resistance, we use vancomycin. Streptogalliticus, also known as bovis, causes subacute bacterial endocarditis. It's a gram-positive cocci against strep species. And the association with underlying colonic carcinoma is extremely high yield. And that brings us into the next question. I'm going to pause right here. Are you guys learning something? Good? Yes? No? Paying attention? Awesome. All right. Virginia, Gabriella, Dar, Zanab. Excellent. And thank you, YouTube family, uh, for joining. We're almost done with the session. Let's go ahead and continue with this multiple choice question. So a public health initiative is noted to increase community outreach in immigrant clinics. The intervention is to increase use of penicillin for the treatment of children who present with sore throat, fever, and tonsillar exudates. Which of the following healthcare costs would be expected to decrease following this intervention of increased use of antibiotics? Serum sickness reactions would decrease. Valvular heart surgery would decrease. C. diff infections would decrease or PSGN incidence would decrease. Excellent. And the best answer here is valvular heart surgery. When we're thinking about treating strep, group A strep infection, excuse me, when we're thinking about treating group A strep infections, we are trying to treat to prevent downstream complications. And the most important one is going to be valvular heart disease, i.e. mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis from rheumatic heart disease. And that's the other focus of today's session. So when we're thinking about the pathophysiology of rheumatic heart disease, remember that it is antibody-mediated disease after a group A streptococcus infection. Rheumatic fever develops because the host develops antibodies against M protein and also cross-reacts with similar human proteins that are surrounding that M protein. So M protein is on the myocardium from group A strep and oh, the surrounding tissue is also affected and that's called molecular mimicry. Further, what that does is causes downstream systemic damage and that is manifested by the Jones criteria that defines the rheumatic, uh, that uh, diagnosis rheumatic fever. Remember that whenever host antibodies are going to attack normal tissue, that is an example of a type two hypersensitivity reaction just to integrate some immunology. So let's go through the pathophysiology of rheumatic heart disease in a little bit more detail. Remember that the initial lesions you can get are mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. And if the rheumatic fever is recurrent or persists, you're going to have mitral stenosis as a long-term complication as well. So patients get strep pharyngitis, you end up having group A strep that is then going to cause inflammation via M protein and molecular mimicry. This can cause a pancarditis. And I want you to really understand that, that the heart in the Jones criteria or the carditis that we talk about in rheumatic fever can be on your USMLE as an endocarditis, which means the valve is messed up the myocarditis or pericarditis. And you want to think of the pancarditis with acute rheumatic disease. Especially related to the myocarditis. If you took a biopsy of a patient who has acute um, uh, rheumatic fever, you're going to see these Ashoff bodies and the Anitzkau cells. And remember, the Ashoff bodies are going to have these activated histiocytes and the fibroblasts. And it is those fibroblasts that then end up causing downstream the mitral stenosis. All right, so let's go through this question. A patient with newly diagnosed rheumatic fever undergoes a basic science clinical study. Upon further analysis of cardiac tissue, the patient is noted to have a protein isolate, which is structurally similar to cardiac tissue. The likely protein isolate is noted to be an extract from the exotoxin of group A strep. 
which of the following best describes the immunologic response of this protein extract? A, endotoxin-mediated disease. B, upregulation of lipopolysaccharide. C, downregulation of CD8-positive T cells. Or D, resistance to phagocytosis. Awesome. So what this experiment is showing is the exotoxin of group A strep, which is the M protein that is structurally similar to the mammalian uh, uh, actin, myosin, tropomyosin, and that is describing molecular mimicry in M protein. And what does the M protein do? Well, M protein is going to resist phagocytosis, a very favorite board question. Remember, when we're thinking about lipopolysaccharide, that is characteristic of gram-negative organisms. And here we are talking about gram-positive organisms. All right. So a summary of group A strep. Group A strep is going to be coming um, uh, in other uh, diseases uh, of the respiratory system especially, but let's just kind of review it. Remember that group A strep can cause pharyngitis, which typically presents as fever plus sore throat plus exudated, exudates on the tonsils. You have rheumatic fever. You have also scarlet fever, cellulitis of the skin, and necrotizing fasciitis, which is a very um, high mortality disease. Now, how do you identify group A strep? Well, it is a gram-positive coccyon chain that has beta hemolysis. It is catalase negative, and it is sensitive to bacitracin. Virulence factors, we talked about M protein and molecular mimicry, especially on, uh, especially in relation to acute rheumatic fever. Remember that it has a hyaluronic capsule that also prevents phagocytosis. The F protein mediates adherence to tissues. Streptolysins are important in group A strep, as well as the cellulitis and neck fash, as well as exotoxins. And typically these are protein AB toxins. The mode of transition is going to be aerosol and pharmacology integrations. We typically use beta-lactams like amoxicillin. Remember that organisms such as group A streptococcus can also make penicillinase, also known as beta-lactamase. And thus, from a pharmacology standpoint, we have to use beta-lactams plus beta-lactamase inhibitor, things such as amoxicillin clavulinic acid which is going to be a beta-lactam plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor, amoxicillin clavulinic acid. And that's uh, from a brand name standpoint known as Augmentin. So let's go ahead and integrate this bacitracin. I like to uh, remember the mnemonic B-BRAS, which means that group B strep is bacitracin resistant. Group A strep is going to be bacitracin sensitive, B-BRAS. All right. Let's go through this question. A five-year-old female presents with fever, chills, and a rash. The patient has a sore throat for the past three days. The patient's rash on physical exam is noted to be raised and erythematous and diffusely spread on the abdomen. She also has erythema of her tongue with no ulcerations. And patient's pharyngeal culture is noted for group A streptococcus. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A, rheumatic fever. B, scarlet fever. C, aplastic anemia. D, Kawasaki disease. Or E, toxic shock syndrome. What do you think is the best answer here? Wonderful. And if you're thinking scarlet fever, you are absolutely correct. Let's review this in a little bit more depth. When I was studying, it was uh, a little bit of a hard distinction for me um, with uh, group A strep, scarlet fever, and rheumatic fever. So I wanted to compare and contrast it for you. Scarlet fever presents as group A strep, i.e. fever plus pharyngitis plus exudates on the tonsils, a strawberry tongue, and this raised papular rash, i.e. it's a sandpaper rough um, texture type of rash. 
You can also have tender anterior cervical lymph nodes, which is representative of the group A strep pharyngitis. Now, remember, rheumatic fever is going to be your Jones criteria, the major criteria being joint pain, carditis. And what kind of carditis is it? It can be tested as a pancarditis. They can either test the endocarditis form, myocarditis, or pericarditis. The nodules that are going to be seen in rheumatic uh, fever, erythema marginatum as the rash in rheumatic fever, and Sindaham's chorea, which is going to be a late manifestation. The microbiology integration here is that both of them are going to be related to strep pyogenes, but it's important to distinguish uh, both scarlet fever and rheumatic fever. All right, next question. Again, these questions keep you very active in your learning. A 14-year-old male presents due to involuntary jerking movements. He was recently adopted from an orphanage in Malaysia. His vaccination status is up to date. The patient's records are notable for outpatient pediatrician visits for sore throat. He takes no medications. Family history is unremarkable. Exam is notable for irregular jerking movements of the hands and legs. Given this patient's symptoms, which of the following laboratory studies may be abnormal? A, joint x-ray. B, BUN to creatinine ratio. C, echocardiogram or D, toxicology screen? What do you think is the best answer here? Excellent. And if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure you put an answer as well. Thank you all for joining. Wonderful. And if you're saying C, abnormal echocardiogram, you're absolutely correct. This patient has Sindaham's chorea, and a history of recurrent group A strep infections, you're worried about mitral regurge or mitral stenosis that could be seen on your echocardiogram. So let's go through the major criteria, how they present on the USMLE, and specific notes related to rheumatic fever. Joints, typically they're going to say migratory arthritis in small joints. The endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis presentation is the heart in the Jones criteria. The nodules, are going to be these subcutaneous tender lesions on the extensor surface of the forearms. This is typically the nodules that you're going to see with uh, uh, the N in the Jones criteria. Erythema marginatum is going to be a C-shaped area of erythema with evanescent circular rings. Again, at the margins, it's very red, erythema marginatum. And then Sindaham's chorea is this rapid involuntary movement that is a late manifestation that we saw in our last question. This is an example of recurrent pericarditis that can lead to fluid surrounding the heart, and that is known as pericardial tamponade. Remember that pericardial tamponade is going to present as a triad, and that is going to include JVP, hypotension and distant heart sounds. So remember that patients who have a carditis can get downstream pericardial tamponade. Other important pathologies that you want to uh, uh, look at here is erythema marginatum. This is different than in Lyme disease. Remember, in Lyme disease, it's not erythema marginatum. It's erythema chronicum migrans. This is going to be Sindaham's chorea, again, the jerking movements uh, that you're seeing in this child. All right, very good. So you can either have two major criteria or one major and two minor criteria. What are minor criteria that you have to know? Well, fever and increased inflammatory markers. Remember from a GenPath tie-in, these are your acute phase reactants. And then you can also have a uh, issue with the electrical activity of the heart, i.e. a prolonged PR interval. And that suggests type one AV block. All right. Speaking of EKGs and arrhythmias, let's go through this question. A 39-year-old female presents with syncope. The patient a month prior noted an erythematous rash with central erythema, which resolved on its own. The patient is an avid hiker and intermittently endorses joint pain for the past month. 
which she attributes to heavy hiking. Vital signs are notable for a low heart rate and blood pressure of 110 over 65. An EKG is performed. Which of the following findings may be noted on EKG? A, irregularly irregular P waves. B, variable RR with progressive lengthening of PR interval. P wave and QRS complex dissociation or D, sawtooth appearance of P waves? What do you think is the best answer here? Right, a lot of great answers in the chat box. Remember that this patient is likely presenting with Lyme disease. And remember that Lyme disease due to Borrelia burgdorferi is going to present, especially secondary Lyme, as a carditis, which includes third degree heart block. Very high yield for us to know. P wave and QRS complex dissociation. So on EKG questions, whenever I see grouped beatings, I think about heart block. So here's a group of beats, here's a group of beats, here's a group of beats, and then here is a group of beats right here. So you, they're all uh, the QRS complexes, especially in third degree heart block, they don't necessarily have a, uh, a quite the pattern to them, but especially they are not going to be associated with P waves. And I think that that is extremely important that here's a P wave and then a QRS, but here's also a P wave and a QRS. So third degree AV block. Another integration that I wanted to put in is that uh, patients who are uh, going to be mothers that have lupus, that are going to have high titers of anti-SSA positive antibodies, those antibodies can actually go across the placenta and can cause in the newborn a lupus-like presentation which includes congenital heart blocks as well as various other cytopenias. But I have seen questions related to congenital heart block and the mom had either lupus or Sjogren syndrome. Both have the uh, predisposition to having the anti-SSA antibodies. All right. So Borrelia burgdorferi. let's go through some active recall. What kind of tick is it? It's going to be the Ixodes deer tick. Remember, anaplasma and babesia also have that similar tick. Features of Lyme disease include bilateral Bell's palsy. Remember, that's cranial nerve 7 dysfunction. This bullseye rash, which is erythema chronica migrans. The arthritis. The AV block. Remember, we talked about the third degree AV block, as well as tertiary Lyme, which is going to be the encephalopathy. All right, going back to rheumatic heart disease, let's go ahead and go through this question. A patient with history of rheumatic heart disease presents with a rumbling diastolic murmur best heard at the apex. Crackles are noted on exam. Which of the following hemodynamic changes may be present? This is an arrow question. And if you haven't checked out my arrow YouTube video, please make sure you do. It's very high yield. I would recommend watching it even before your uh, USMLE exam. All right, so your uh, hemodynamic uh, factors are gonna be pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. You're gonna have preload as well as cardiac output. What do you think? All right. Really good answers here. Let's go through it. Remember that this rumbling diastolic murmur, what kind of murmur is it? That's going to be mitral stenosis. Very important for you to know. And the patient has crackles on lung exam, and that's because the patient can't get blood from the LA into the LV due to the stenotic mitral valve. So LA then backs up into the pulmonary veins and causes a very high pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. Remember that preload is left ventricular and diastolic volume. So if the patient is going to have mitral stenosis, can the LV have a lot of blood in diastole? And the answer is no. You're going to have low preload. 
And then finally, because your preload is going to be low, your stroke volume is going to be low. So remember, stroke volume is dependent on contractility, afterload, and preload. So if your preload is low, stroke volume is low, and stroke volume times heart rate is equal to cardiac output. And so if your stroke volume is low, your cardiac output is going to be low. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and go through the pathophysiology of mitral stenosis. Why am I bringing this in? Because this is going to be one of the valvular pathologies associated with acute rheumatic fever. Remember, you have a mid-diastolic murmur. Typically, there is that opening snap with mitral stenosis. You end up getting blood backed up because of the stenotic valve into the pulmonary circulation, causing pulmonary hypertension. Chronic mitral stenosis and chronic pulmonary hypertension can cause right heart hypertrophy, and thus you can get core pulmonary or right heart failure. Remember, you have reduced cardiac output because you have less preload in mitral stenosis. How do you tell the difference between mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation? Remember, both are gonna be murmurs heard best at the apex. Mitral regurgitation, very importantly, is a systolic murmur, whereas mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur. Mitral regurgitation, because you have regurge from the LV back into the LA and the blood goes back and forth, back and forth. You actually have increased preload. And both pathologies actually have increased left atrial pressures. And that's because in mitral regurgitation, again, that blood is going from LV back up into the LA and that increased blood is causing increased pressure. All right, almost done with today's session. Let's go ahead and go through this question. A patient with history of mitral stenosis presents for dysphagia. The patient's barium swallow shows decreased contrast, excuse me, decreased contrast filling in the mid esophageal region. Which of the following cardiac structures is abnormal in this patient? A, right ventricle, B, left ventricle, C, right atrium, or D, left atrium? What do you think is the best answer here? Wonderful. And if you said D, left atrium, you're absolutely correct. USMLA likes to go for these questions. Why? Because they want you to know that the right ventricle is the one that's closest to the sternum, whereas the left atrium is going to be the most posterior and closest to this structure, which is the esophagus. If you have mitral stenosis, you can have left atrial hypertrophy, and that left atrial hypertrophy can compress on local structures, specifically the esophagus. I want to do a quick little morphology summary. We talked about both strep and staph. Remember that both are going to be aerobic cocci. In the case of streptococcus, it is catalase negative, whereas staphylococcus is going to be catalase positive. Staphylococcus aureus is going to be not only catalase positive, but coagulase positive. And I remember that because it's alphabetical. Catalase comes before coagulase. Coagulase negative staph, we talked about that related to staph epidermidis and the prosthetic joint infections. If we look at the other side, remember that gram positive cocci in chains are going to be your catalase negative streptococci. They are going to be uh, differentiated based on hemolysis pattern. Alpha hemolysis, we talked about the viridan streptococci. Remember that they are going to be optogen resistant compared to strep pneumo. Remember that group, uh, uh, excuse me, remember that beta hemolytic streptococci is going to be group B and group A strep. And I like to remember B bras. Remember that group A strep is bacitracin sensitive. And then you have variable or no hemolysis, and that is going to be a characteristic of enterococcus. Let's go ahead and finish up with talking a little bit about myocarditis. All right, here we go. What is the likely infectious organism behind this patient's symptoms? A six-year-old boy presents with shortness of breath, sore throat, and fever. 
The patient is unimmunized. Vital signs are notable for mild fever and tachycardia. Crackles are heard in bilateral lung fields. The airway is midline. There is no uvular deviation. However, there is erythema to the posterior oropharynx with bilateral exudates. Culture of oropharynx is obtained, which is notable for aerobic gram-positive bacteria with metachromatic granules. What is the likely infectious organism behind this patient's symptoms? Clostridium tetany, Clostridium difficile, Staph aureus, Cornea bacterium diphtheriae, or Coxsackie B? What do you think is the best answer? Go ahead and put your answer into the chat box. Hang with me here. You guys are doing great. And with the pharyngitis in the unimmunized patient and the signs of myocarditis, you're going to be thinking about diphtheria in this patient. You're absolutely correct. So pathophysiology of diphtheria, exceedingly high yield. Remember that the toxigenic diphtheria colonizes the respiratory tract. Subsequently, you get a pharyngitis. But in particular, you can get inhibition of translation, i.e. you get protein synthesis that is affected. And why or how? That is because Cornea bacterium diphtheriae does ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two, and this is exceedingly high yield. Remember that diphtheria, because of the inhibition of translation, you can have myocarditis, neurologic toxicity. Because of the pharyngitis, you can even get airway obstruction. They say leathery bull neck tonsils uh, as a kind of a buzzword. Remember that other organisms that have ADP ribosylation associated with them? Pseudomonas. So pseudomonas and diphtheria both have ADP ribosylation of elongation factor two. What type of vaccine prevents diphtheria? Again, these public health questions are more prominent on your USMLE step one. And that is understanding that both DTAP and TDAP are toxoid-based vaccines. All right. So cornea bacterium diphtheria. Let's go through it. Can cause respiratory diphtheria, myocarditis, or neurologic toxicity. They are described as gram positive club shaped rods that are going to have metachromatic, metachromatic red and black colonies on tellulite auger, also known as Loeffler's medium. Virulence is going to be an AB toxin that is an exotoxin. It inhibits elongation factor two via ADP ribosylation. Cornea bacterium is going to be encoded, the virulence factor in particular is encoded by a gene phage. The mode of transition is aerosol. And remember that we prevent via vaccinations and you can give antitoxin immunoglobulin as uh, uh, post-exposure or not post-exposure, but when you have invasive respiratory dip diphtheria, you can consider that as a treatment option. Now, what are other organisms whose virulence factors are going to be encoded by a lysogenic phase? Well, think about the mnemonic ABCDs. We already talked about diphtheria toxin being encoded by a gene phage, but the group A strep erythrogenic toxin, the botulism toxin, the cholera toxin, which causes a watery rice water diarrhea, as well as the shiga toxin. Speaking of shiga toxin, pseudomonas, diphtheria, let's go through the organisms which inhibit protein synthesis. Again, mechanisms, like we said in the introduction, very high yield with microbiology. Inactivation of elongation factor two, pseudomonas and cornea bacterium diphtheriae, and 60S ribosomal subunit inhibition, that is characteristic for shiga toxin. I say shiga 60, shiga 60, and then EHEC or E. coli 0157H7, which causes HUS, for example. Uh, and that's how it presents on USMLE questions as well. So we're going to wrap up and talk a little bit about myocarditis. When it comes to myocarditis on the USMLE, remember that it presents like heart failure. Globally, it presents as reduced cardiac output. And structurally, myocarditis 
can give you global dilation of all chambers of the heart. And as you can see, this heart is not contracting as well. Because myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle, you get signs of heart failure in your USMLE vignettes. You can also get arrhythmias, specifically ventricular arrhythmias, and patients with heart failure present with dyspnea, chest pain, and in particular with myocarditis, they can have fever. Now, a nice clinical point as well as on your USMLE is to note that whenever you have sinus tachycardia that is out of proportion to the fever, you're going to be thinking about, man, is the heart muscle itself irritated, i.e. does the patient have myocarditis? So what are the causes of myocarditis for the USMLE? Well, they're bacterial, viral, and fungal. Bacterial causes. We talked about Borrelia burgdorferi. Mycoplasma can also cause myocarditis and diphtheria, which got us into this integration. Viral causes, extremely high yield, Coxsackie B. Coxsackie B causing viral myocarditis. That is extremely important. And then finally, parasitic etiologies, such as trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease. Another important immunology tie-in for the USMLE, especially related to viral myocarditis, is this pathology slide which shows lymphocytes that are going to invade or be present in the myocardium. Whenever you see that lymphocytes are in the myocardium, you're going to be thinking about myocarditis due to a viral etiology. And they love to test you on that because how do we fight against viruses? We use CDA positive at times lymphocytes. All right. So let's review myocarditis. Coxsackie B causes myocarditis. It is an unenveloped, positive, single-stranded RNA virus. Remember that it causes direct viral injury and the lymphocytic infiltration of the myocardium. Method of transmission is fecal-oral. Trypanosoma cruzi is a parasite that causes dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis. It can cause megacolon and achalasia. It is a protozoa. Typically, whenever I see high amount of eosinophils, and a travel in the vignette, I think about parasitic infections. The kissing bug, also known as the reduvid bug, actually bites and defecates and causes entry into the uh, mucosa. Sometimes that can be near the eye, and that's that Romagna sign that you can see in uh, Chagas disease. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of today's session. I just ask you for a couple more minutes of your time, but I just want to uh, uh, inquire whether you all learned something in today's session. Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Ayan, thanks so much. Wonderful. All right. Well, just a couple more minutes. I just want to uh, uh, give you guys some special announcements um, for future webinars and some resources that I think will be helpful for your USMLE exam. I just released my comprehensive updated NBME top concepts notes. These notes are jam-packed with high yield, active recall, question-based material for your USMLE, NBME, comp exams, even your school module exams. I have a password protected PDF that you can get as well as you can purchase the book on Amazon and it comes printed right to your study space. What's so cool is that these notes follow my free NBME top concepts videos. So you can get the book and you can watch the videos and go back and forth and review some high yield USMLE material. What's the difference between my free NBME top concepts videos and the pass fail course? Well, the high guru USMLE step one pass fail course has all of the important subjects as well as learning strategies for your USMLE step one exam. With the pass fail course, you get 66 hours of comprehensive USMLE content that is in a question-based format. After every single video, I put custom question IDs from UWorld. You'll get the handouts. You also get high yield images that you see with each organ system. And I've started to embed both NBME style questions and quiz cards to make your learning even more interactive and hone in on these concepts. So please check out the USMLE pass fail course as you'll be able to make custom UWorld blocks in your step one QBank. I really appreciate you all joining me today for this review. 
I also have test taking strategies courses, as well as my uh, one-on-one tutoring program. I would highly recommend you reach out if you need anything whatsoever in your journey. Follow me on social media. I would love to hear your feedback also on Trustpilot, which is um, going to be uh, a link that I will send you after this webinar. But before you leave today, please go ahead and type in one thing that you learned, and then we will go ahead and uh, end today's session. Awesome. Hey, Elizabeth, thanks so much for uh, that that shout out. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, thank you. Excellent. Go ahead and type in one thing that you learned before uh, we